way that she had a problem with the billboard, so we're going straight to you. Okay, come straight to me. Good evening. This is Execution Watch. My name is Ray Hill, and I am uh, the usual host of this. We are produced by uh, Elizabeth Stein. Uh, We have a little trouble with the billboard tonight, so we won't begin with the wonderful voice of Larry Douglas, but he will be on the show, as will Susan Ashley and Jim Skelton. Uh, uh, We also uh, will have an interview today uh, with Mike, with uh, Steve Wood himself. At Steve's request, I went to Huntsville, I mean to Livingston last Wednesday uh, with a crew, a uh, technical crew and Elizabeth, and interviewed Stephen through the glass in the death row visiting room. Uh, checking with the uh, uh, Attorney General's office, uh, we discovered that uh, Stephen had exhausted pending appeals, so we're waiting on word from Huntsville if the process has begun. And as soon as Elizabeth gets that set off, we will have Gloria Ruback on. Uh, Gloria Ruback called me earlier from the station and said she is on their way. I'd like to take a personal privilege thing as the host of this program. This is the first program uh, where we have tried to... Uh, speak with uh, the person who is being executed and as an interview in this show. That changes the paradigm for me. Uh, normally, I come in here and I host this show, and I've agreed to do this on the basis that uh, I can read the names, and uh, I frequently uh, report the execution of people that I either know uh, for other reasons, or I have communicated with. But this is the first time in uh, d- d- several years of doing this show that I actually saw and talked to Stephen. That is an emotional difference for me than it is for the other shows that we have done. We will proceed as usual. We get a report from Huntsville about the progress of the process. And uh, Elizabeth is setting that call up now. Uh, and then we will go to another activist who is at a vigil here in Houston and give them encouragement. And then we will go... Uh, uh, here into um, a discussion of what happened in this case uh, uh, and uh, what the uh, evidence shows from the trial and the hearings, various hearings, what happened in the case. And then uh, we will report uh, what is the legal history of this case, uh, trial, uh, rounds of appeals, what happened to the issues that were raised. That is the way we do this. And so if you're a first-time listener, uh, you're listening by several arena. Either you're listening on broadcast KPFT FM 90.1 here in Houston, or you're listening on the HD one channel of KPFT's uh, radio station, or you may be listening through the KPFT website, kpft.org, or you may be listening from our own website, executionwatch.org. Elizabeth is uh, getting the call set up, and as soon as she puts that on hold, I will uh, uh, then communicate with Gloria. Uh, Elizabeth is uh, making notes in the process, and the, the... the telephone line went dead, so uh, I don't know if we have a report from Huntsville or not. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, can you give us a report from Huntsville? Well, not having a report ready for Huntsville, the billboard didn't work tonight. We're having technical problems that we haven't suffered in the whole thing. Uh, uh, who's going to tell me what happened to this case? Susan? Okay. Uh, the facts of the case are this. Okay. Stephen Michael Woods and... Uh, Marcus, uh, let's see, Marcus Rhodes were both charged in these murders. Two people were murdered. Uh, there was a young man named Ronald Patrick Whitehead, who was 21 years old, and Bethina Lynn Braz, who was 19. Both the young man and young woman were killed. What happened is in May of 2001, Two golfers were driving down a Boyd Road at Tribute Golf Course near Colony, Texas, and they came upon the bodies of Ronald Whitehead and Bethany Braz. Both had been shot in the head, and both people had their throats cut. The male was dead, and the female was still alive at the time. The bodies were found, but she died the next day. So, obviously, police were called, 
And that same evening, police received several anonymous calls to Crime Stoppers where people reported that Woods was involved in the killings and that Marcus Rhodes was involved in the killings. So detectives went out and interviewed Woods. Woods admitted being with the victims the night before, but he said that he was leading them in a car to a, a location or a house, but they, the two cars became disconnected during the trip that he left them and he returned to the Deep Ellum section of Dallas. Woods was not arrested at the, after this interview. Detectives also then, they interviewed Rhodes, and when they interviewed Rhodes, they also searched his car and they found items belonging to the male and female whitehead and bras. Both victims' backpacks were found in the trunk of Rhodes' Mercedes, and Rhodes' fingerprints were on weapons, and his car was littered with shell casings. There were guns registered in his name that they apparently found under his bed at his parents' home in Dallas. But those were not the guns used in the killings? Um, there's no, we don't have any information what guns were used in the killings, or what, what gun was used. Because essentially what Rhodes, the police obviously recovered that gun from Rhodes and Rhodes was arrested, but Woods left the Dallas area after the interview with police, Woods left and he traveled from Dallas. He was in New Orleans, he was in Idaho and he was in California. He was finally arrested in California and he interviewed, police interviewed him when he was arrested in California. Now, several witnesses told police and testified at the trial that before the killings that he had told these witnesses about his plans to commit the murders and then after the killings that he told them about his participation in the murder, murders. And people had report told that to the police and they testified to that effect at trial. And this case was tried in Denton County? Yeah, one of the things I want to mention. I need a microphone here. One of the oh, oh, hold on just a second. Uh, let me get Glory on. Gloria? Hello? Hi, Ray. Hi, Gloria. Tell us what's going on in Huntsville. Well, there's about 10 or 12 of us out here. Well, including three nice people from a television thing in France. But the execution is happening. The media went into the death house. Uh, Steve fiance, mom, and I'm assuming brothers went in to witness. So the execution is now taking place. Um, There's a a group here. There's I think about 15 people in Austin. So there's protests going on around the state. And I, you know, I want to let listeners know that there's four executions coming up. There's another one Thursday. And I want to invite people to a press conference tomorrow at 3 o'clock in front of the Harris County Courthouse where the death penalty abolition movement and Quan LX and some other activists are going to be making a demand that Pat Lycos intervene in this execution because the execution Thursday of Dwayne Buck revolves around a man, a black man, who was sentenced to death because he's black. He had a psychiatrist testify that his race determined that... Yeah, the, uh, the Internet is pretty much covering the language of that psychiatrist that's right. saying on the issue of dangerousness, he's black or Hispanic, therefore he's dangerous. Uh, but I want to stick tonight's show to uh, uh, to uh, Steve Wood's case. and okay. uh, But I appreciate you making the announcement. The press conference is tomorrow at what at time? Three. At 3. At 3. Yeah, 3 o'clock in, at 1201 Franklin in front of the Harris County Courthouse. Uh, Dwayne Buck's sister, who survived the shooting, will be there to speak out uh, for a stop to his execution. Okay, Gloria, keep us posted on what's going on in, in Huntsville. Uh, Elizabeth has another call lined up for me. Okay, all right. Okay, bye-bye. bye-bye. That was Gloria Ruback, who uh, is uh, Mercy. Glory Ruback, who is uh, with the uh, abolition movement, and uh, she is our witness in Huntsville. And I guess this is Dave. Is this you? Whoop! Dave is not there, uh, Elizabeth. And uh, so that uh, did that. So, uh, but Dave Atwood is at a vigil here in Houston, and we were fixing to go into Jim. What happened in these trials? Was anything remarkable about the trial? Let me tell you one of the problems we have in evaluating these cases. All we're able to get 
of the appellate opinions, that doesn't necessarily reflect all the evidence introduced at trial. So we don't know whether or not there were ballistic evidence introduced at trial. It was just never an issue yeah. on appeal. Because, see, what we have, we only have two opinions to look at. We have the direct appeal from the Court of Criminal Appeals that affirmed the case. Mm -hmm. Then we have the record from the post-conviction writ. Mm -hmm. But that does reflect all the evidence introduced at trial. I suspect, however, had ballistics tied the murder weapon to the co-defendant, that would have been an issue on appeal. But we don't know. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah, it, it, don't I know. Mean, and, it, and that you've got two cases. Right. One of them went on appeal. Right. We don't know that uh, the other fellow's cases right. were appealed, do we? No, well, he entered a plea of guilt and got life without parole. He wouldn't appeal that. Are you nuts? Because yes. if they come back and try him for the death penalty. It was a bargain. No, he isn't going to do that. And the issue, the big issue that I had a problem with on appeal, uh, the two issues that Larry had a problem with, the limitation on voir dire during the trial. And by the way, is it Woods or Wood? Is it an S on the end? The opinions say S, yes. Woods. It's Woods. 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 Yeah, Woods. Woods, okay. The thing I have a real quarrel with is they... Uh, wait a minute. I've got Dave Atwood finally uh, has gotten here. Dave, where are you and what's going on? Uh, well, we're out here at the corner of Woodhead and West Alabama right in front of St. Stephen's St. Church. St. Stephen's Church tonight. Right. And, and uh, we've got a good, pretty good turnout here. I think we had seven or eight people here. I think uh, we come back for a hot day out in the sun, or almost in the sun anyway. Um, but um, that's where we are. We're, you know, I think I said before, we have a lot of cars go by this corner, uh, hundreds, really. Sure. And uh, so it's a good place to get our message out, Ray. Okay, uh, uh, that's not too far. Where is the Peace and Justice Center these days? Where is it? It's over at the uh, Houston Mennonite Church is where we have Ah, okay, you have your office at the Mennonite Church. But but there are a lot of uh, uh, activities that go on at St. Stephen's Church. Uh, there's uh, the Houston Interfaith Justice Group has their office here, and the pastor of this church, Lisa Hunt, is a very a progressive person. And so there are a lot of events that take place over here at St. Stephen's, and and she's very receptive to us being out in front of her church and and doing our protest against the death penalty. In fact, she comes out and joins us every now and then. All right. Really nice. And to learn more about you and your organization, folks can go to uh, www.tcadp.org. Texas okay. Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. Right. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye. I'm sorry, Jim. Things oh, no problem. He's confused sorry. tonight, and they're going nine no, way no directions from Sunday. See, the problem I have with this case, the only problem I had with the direct appeal was this. Number one, he, in this particular case, the co-defendant, Marcus Rhodes, confessed to the police and incriminated Woods. Yes. Yeah. Woods never confessed to the police, although he made damaging admissions to friends of his. Now, here's one thing that really bothers me about the direct appeal. And I must say this, Judge Price wrote the opinion he's considered a good judge for the defense bar. Now, what happened, and you have to understand hearsay, well, and I don't want to make this too lawyerese. Hearsay is simply a statement made outside the courthouse that they're offered to tell the truth. They say it's truthful. Yeah. And one of the exceptions to the hearsay rule is if you make an admission against your interest. Because the question on hearsay is this reliable statement. So if I make a statement that incriminates me, they're going to say that's reliable. I wouldn't be at Fessy up to that. Okay. And that's called a, the lawyer term for that is a mission against penal interest. Okay. Now what happened, they called two witnesses, a guy named Samuelson, a gal named Swartz. And here's what they testified to. They testified the co-defendant, Marcus Rhodes, told them prior to the killing that Woods had a job that he wanted to, Rhodes to do and Rhodes didn't want to do it. Okay. After the killing, they claimed that Marcus Rhodes came back to them and said that Woods took their credit card from the dead man, ordered some items off the Internet, had them sent to a friend to divert attention from him, and shift it to his friend. Now, they admitted those statements under a penal lint, under that exception, admission against interest, because Marcus said it. He's incriminating himself. And it's your opinion that that should not have been admitted. Well, here's why. 
every hearsay statement also violates the confrontation rule because the Sixth Amendment says you have the right to confront those that accuse you. And I thought this violated the confrontation rule. There's a case called Crawford versus Washington. There's a jillion cases that discuss this. And I thought it violated the confrontation rule. They sneaked around that by saying that this was not, quote, a testimonial statement because when Woods, when when the co-defendant said that, he didn't anticipate, the witness didn't anticipate that be used for later prosecution. I have a real problem with that. And the reason I have a problem with it, because there was no physical evidence linking Woods to the crime scene so far as we know. The only way they linked it to him was his prior statement to the police that he was with the victims, the two people, the night before the night of the killings. That's somewhat confusing. And led them to a house. There's nothing that putting him at the crime scene, as far as I know, no DNA evidence, no anything. All they had were admissions made like this. And I think that would be very damaging because if the jury believed what these two witnesses said, that puts Woods at the crime scene. That puts Woods being actively involved in it. And that's based to me. That shows that he never had right to cross-examine those people. Okay. I thought that was wrong. And we have another person. We have someone calling in who is Woods' aunt. And uh, we're going to put her on the air. Hello? To whom I speak? Hello? What's your name? My name is Abby Youngby. I am actually sitting here with his boy's mother. Okay. Go ahead, please. Uh, you know, it, it is a travesty of justice that's going on here. The fact that we can sit here and, and, and thank God your program's out there, sir, because, you know, we're, we're wondering what his last words are going to be. He's never met his children. You know, had, had this gone in, in any kind of way, had, you know, the Marcus Rhodes father not been some, you know, high-profile CPA in Dallas, you know, there might have been more of a, a look at this case because there was just, you know, judicial misconduct all through it. He was denied several rights. You know, they didn't put anybody on the stand for him. The lawyers, I, I'm not Steve's aunt. <laughs> I, I am an aunt to his voice. Oh, okay. You know, this, this boy, these boys need family. Okay. You know, they're losing their father today. I understand. They need somebody now, to stand up and say something for them. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes, sir. I, 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 I'm reluctant to open the radio show up to calls i appreciate your calling in give my sympathy to the whole family uh, uh what we have what? to go on here is what is in the well, record i just wanted to let you know you are you are stating things that are not the case you know his dna you know it was also reported down in the texas news that his dna was on something his dna was not we was have not we evidence. have ma'am we have not reported his dna is on anything uh, no I, this is just other yeah, Places but but we're not we're, we're not others. What we are reporting on, and we we are scrupulously careful to be ethical about reporting what is in the record. And as my attorney has just told me, that this record is very lacking because all we have is the appellate record. We do not have access to the trial record in this case. Uh, so we do not know what was introduced in trial and what was not. So we are reporting what we have found in the record, and we have not reported that Stephen's DNA was found at the scene or anything near the scene. We are reporting that the record uh, uh, does not have that evidence contained in it. That's because it was stricken from the record. There's also two judges down there. Ma'am, 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 are you saying that Stephen's Stephen presence Sternow. at the scene was stricken from the record? Uh, yes, sir. No, no, I, no. I, I think that works out to Stephen's disadvantage. What we are reporting is that the record does not indicate Stephen was even present. Well, ex exactly. Okay. The, that the only DNA that was found was Marcus Rhodes, sir. Okay. And well, the well, we don't, the we don't, so that the appellate could not we, hear it. we do not have a record of Robert, Robert, uh, of, of, of Rhodes' trial because he never had one. Right. Oh, he, he pled. There was no trial. There were no appeals. But right. thank you very much for calling. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. I, 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 I don't know. We're going to have to establish some ground rules around here uh, if we're going to continue to do the show because I think, thank you, 
uh, 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 Jim Skelton, and thank you, uh, 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 Susan, for reporting accurately what the record shows. I think we want to stick to that. I, I think that, I mean, Gloria uh, is uh, uh, wonderful at, at telling us uh, uh, what she thinks about things, and we accept that. Uh, but if we open this up too broadly, we're not going to do Stephen or the other people whose cases we cover here. And it's time for me to ask the wonderful voice, Mr. Douglas. Uh, Mr. Douglas, what have you found in all of this? Well, uh, in my opinion... Uh, the under the law and as as the procedures go, the appropriate thing appears to have been done. Uh, I, I've got a, a fairness issue, okay, that was just totally outside the law. That that is that that when I when I look at the the, the limited record that we have, and, and that's that's just normal in all cases. Uh, we have a one man going to death row, and another person serving a life sentence without parole. Uh, who did, in essence, something very similar. So, so I, I've, I've always have concerns about prosecutorial discretion, uh, particularly as it relates to who's going to get the death penalty and who's not going to get it. And, and that's just the overall general concern that I have in this case. Uh, but, uh, you know, he was selected for, as the one to receive the death penalty, and, and it, it appears that he got a reasonably fair trial. Uh, uh, based just based on how trials go and the looks of the appellate thing, and, and and is there any reason to believe his appellate attorneys were less than adequate? No, in fact, uh, if you're looking at his lawyers, uh, his trial lawyers were just great. Okay, they they did an, an excellent job in 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 representing him, and then tailoring the evidence in such a fashion to to his, to his best interest. Uh, but uh, um, uh, the the appellate lawyers did, did an adequate job also. Is, isn't there a hazard if you try a case and you're absolutely Johnny on the spot that you limit the chances of even getting an appeal? You always have an automatic appeal on the death penalty. On the death penalty, you, you have automatic it. but you may you not have anything it. to talk about. Well, not always, because they, they, if you read these death penalty cases... Uh, they a lot of them are sent out there on written on a word processing machine. But in this case, I'm going to add to what Larry said. You know, it's always fashionable to blame the lawyers. One of the problems they had, the lawyers were pretty well hamstrung. I see you got a call coming. We'll talk about that later. Gloria. Yeah. You're on. Hello. You're on. Oh, okay. What has happened? Um, Steve's family just came out. The execution is over. And the ordeal of four executions in eight days is has begun. Um, I'm, we're waiting for Stephen's uh, fiance to come down here and join us, but she has gone into the administration building with the family. So I oh. guess. It'll be a few minutes. Okay, Gloria, uh, we're going to go back because I think what I want to do is play Stephen's tape. You want to? Oh, okay. Okay. All right, great. Thank you, and, and we'll talk to you later. Okay. That was Gloria Ruback. What she reported is the witnesses have come out of the building, and that meant they, uh, at the beginning of the process, the witnesses come out of the administration building, they cross the street, and they go into the walls. Inside the walls, they are conducted through uh, a rat maze, and they get to the execution chamber. The process begins. When it is over, Steve Woods is dead. And they have come out and crossed the street and gone back to the administration building. What has happened to Stephen right now is that uh, Carnes, uh, the person with a contract to deal with the bodies of people executed on death row, are taking his body to the Huntsville Funeral Home. The family members may go there and touch the body while it still contains warmth. I know that sounds dreadfully morbid, but this is the first time that anyone in Stephen's family have had an opportunity to touch him since he got to death row many years ago. Now, uh, I've got a room full of people who've got wonderful and important things to say, and we will be back to them. But I think what I would like to do right now is to play that 20-minute interview uh, that Mark Pirtle recorded between uh, Steve Woods and I last Wednesday.
Where do you come from, Stephen? I come from uh, just around Detroit, Michigan, Livonia. Wow, it's yeah. cold. Yeah, well, it's nice. It's it, it's not 110 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> what brought you in Texas? Oh, uh, I was trying to get to California. I was hitchhiking. I've been on the street since I was about 16 years old. Um, I got locked up when I was 21, so I spent the most of my adult life out there. Uh, I was just trying to get to California, and I wasn't the best geography student. I ended up landlocked in Dallas. Is that where your case is? My case is in Denton County. Denton County. Yeah. Denton County is in Burling County. I always tell my friends don't do anything. Yes. In Denton, Williamson, <laughs> Montgomery County. Right, right. Those are the worst. Uh, you can get a lot of time in Denton for things that would be a civil case elsewhere. Oh, yeah. So, but you know all about that. I do now, yeah. Uh, you mind telling me what happened? Um, they say I have a law parties case. Mm -hmm. uh, and that only came out after my appeal. What happened was a man named Marcus Rhodes and I and my friend Ron and his girlfriend Beth all went to go do a drug deal. Okay. And Marcus ended up killing Ron and Beth in front of me. Uh, well, he killed Ron in front of me and he killed Beth while I was hiding in his car. And after that, they, they, they convicted me and sentenced me to death. I really don't Were even, you tried together separately? No, I was tried separately. Uh, I was tried first. What happened to him? He got life sentence. Life yeah, with, so he's the guy that beat the, got the cops for it. He got life with parole. He was arrested first, and he never, never uh, when he stood up in court and, and confessed to it and, and took his time, he never said anything about me. He never had to testify in my trial. Mm -hmm. um, what it was is his parents are pretty affluent in Dallas. He lived in Highland Park. and I run across those kids. Right. His father works for the Justice Department and played golf with a district attorney in Denton County, Bruce Isaacs. So they tried me first and let him live. What do you know about what he did? I was... I, I mean, he, he killed Ron right in front of me. I was actually sprayed with a little bit of Ron's blood when he was murdered. Uh, tried in Denton County? Tried in Denton County. Tell me about your trial. My trial was a farce. Um, there was no physical evidence linking me to the crime, no eyewitnesses. All it was a bunch of Marcus's friends got together and got up on tip the stand and said that I was bragging about the murder after it happened. So any evidence that would directly connect you to the murder would have been hearsay evidence. Exactly. They heard you say under different circumstances and things. Mm -hmm. and these were people that were close to your... Yeah, there was one jailhouse snitch who, when Mark Marcus was arrested first, I was arrested several months later in the state of California. Um, so you got out of the scene you were headed west. Right. Uh, one of the, somebody was arrested and put in the tank with Marcus was let go from jail. I got arrested, extradited. He was put in the tank with me solely for the purpose of getting information. Uh -huh. And uh, he testified that I had told him everything that happened and all this. It's since, during a post-conviction uh, investigation, we got him to say that he lied on the stand. But my attorney wasn't very competent, didn't include it in the writ, um, barely even had anything to do with it. How long have you been on the road? I've been on the road for nine and a half years. Nine and a half years. Nine and a half years. And so this is like a new beginning for you. Oh, yeah. New beginning altogether. Uh, because is someone working on the records of that, him getting out of jail and getting transferred to West Coast or ever how that was that he wound up in the tank with you? or. Mm, well, see, I, no, because he, there's he, he, he didn't go. Involved. He waited until I was extradited. Okay, he didn't get close to you. You were right. Back he got locked up for a simulated controlled substance charge, okay. fake methamphetamine, yeah. um, which is a fake charge. Quick, but yeah, um, he was also under investigation for murder, and he had defrauded the University of North Texas for twenty five thousand dollars. As soon as he testified against me, they dropped the fraud charge, let him keep the $25,000, dropped the simulated controlled substance charge, which would have put him back in prison because he had 11 years on his parole to do, mm -hmm. and just completely dropped the murder investigation. So it gave him a walk in exchange for exactly. uh, incriminating statements or evidence yes. from you, and that, too, was hearsay. Yes. I heard him say yes. um, They tried to pull some physical evidence and link it to me, uh, a rubber glove, because all the fingerprints on the weapons were Marcus's. Uh, they were found in his house, under his bed, 
It was a 380 and a little Derringer pistol. Whose gun was it? Um, one of them was Marcus's mother. The other was his. Um, they're big game hunters. They okay. have all kinds of guns and trophies. Uh, I mean, been, Marcus has been a professional killer since he was seven years old. So the weapons were traceable to him and his family? Yes, yes. And there was nothing. nothing. You traveled around the country with empty pockets, right? Pretty much. I had a laptop and some clothing. Trail Makes you very vulnerable in these kinds of situations. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah, and I was incredibly naive to the legal process and legal, uh, the whole situation. I didn't know what I was getting into. I was way over my head. Um, How old are you now? I'm 31. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was middle-aged right about that time, 16 years old. 16? Yeah. So they had to qualify you as an adult? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm sorry, when I got down to Texas. I was, oh, okay, 16 years when we got to Texas. So how old are you when the kids have? 21. And you were staying in Denton? I was staying in Louisville. Louisville. Uh, with my fiance and her parents. Uh, and broke up with her and started staying back on the streets. I was with her for about six months in her house. It's the only time I ever had a stable living situation. Mm. And uh, then when this came down, you had to head out. Mm. You had to keep on rolling. Yeah. What were you going to do with your life? I really didn't have any plans. Uh, I was just going where life took me. Um, from here to there, New York City. New York City Drugs played an important role in that. Hmm? Drugs played an important role. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, from 16 to 19, I was a junkie. Uh, so, it's just where the junk took me. Where the junk took me? Yeah. That's a lifestyle. A lot of people don't understand that. But oh, yeah. That's and not an uncommon lifestyle. Oh, God, it's so incredibly hard to break, man. How long have you been on the road? I've been on the road for, for nine and a half years. Nine and a half years. Know a lot of people. Seen a lot of people come. Lot seen people. a lot of people go, man. Yeah. Some of them get out because they were under 18 when mm -hmm. it happened. So you've seen the real, what is real life like? For me, it's about 23 hours a day just trying to ignore what's going on around me. Um, I don't like to get involved in prison politics and all the he said, she said crap that goes on back here. So I just stay to myself and read, uh, study. What do you read? I'll read anything that comes in front of me. Um, I was trying to speak, learn how to speak German for okay. a while. I already have Russian down a little bit. Um, I love classical literature. I love science fiction, fantasy. Yeah, imagination stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was a dreamer when I was a kid. I'm a playwright and an actor. That's where the radio comes from. It's yeah. Play Lois Lane. <laughs> you listen to Prison Show? Yes, I've been listening to Prison Show since I've been doing here. it right. Yeah, definitely. Um, the only thing I can say is you don't have enough phone lines. <laughs> well, we have to, we've only got, David is working on yeah, that actually. Got, uh, David is working on a system whereby as soon as we go on the air, he will get 20 people on the line and then cut them off mm -hmm. because it's going to take him, yeah. he's counted 20. I could do on a good day 30 mm -hmm. in an hour. And I don't force people to hurry, but then I don't chat a lot. Right. I look for something funny. <laughs> Try to get a little laugh going on down the cell block. Not right. many laughs down there. Right. Yeah, when I first got here and I heard you talking about honoring down the pipe, Jason, like, what? what? The hell is that? <laughs> Previous generation. Yeah, you know, it would be, they sailed cell block in the old days or back-to-back sales, mm -hmm. and there's pipe chase in between the two cells. Yeah. And if you were on the right floor, you could holler down the pipe case and talk to a friend on the other end. Of course, everybody, including the man, was eavesdropping on what you mm -hmm. say, so mm -hmm. you weren't getting away with any sneakers. But and you could actually have to holler, so... <laughs> right. Right. I've been... I did the prison show for <coughs> 30 years. Mm -hmm. Nine months and two weeks. <laughs> man, so you've been there, yeah. yeah. But I... I keep remembering being here. Mm -hmm. 
not the Polanski, but the Ramsey. 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 Oh, Ramsey. Oh. I did most of my time with Ramsey right, as right. maintenance and construction bookkeeper. We went out with a 160-year sentence, and within a week, I was outside the compound in the maintenance shack. And within six months, I was had a pickup truck as the construction bookkeeper, so I arrived to another unit, check my sights. Right. Huh? They don't run prisons like that anymore. Yeah, no. I went back to the Ramsey, and there were two free world people sitting in the office that I used to occupy by myself. <laughs> but uh, you don't know anything about general population. You didn't do any time other than this. No, this is the first time I've ever been locked up. Um, I was in trouble as a youth uh, with uh, sexual harassment, but I, was, I got probation for that. Um, Little time in jail. No, I didn't do any time in jail. Really? Yeah, it was. Uh, I was like fourteen. The girl. Oh, okay. Went, it was. It was a friend of mine. And and you didn't have to wait out a trial. and just yeah. resolved it right away as a juvenile. Right. I played, I played no contest. Got uh, probation for a year. Did about two months of it, and they discharged me from the probation. Okay. So you don't care much for the other people in the room. A lot of them, no, not really. Um, they're just not my type of people. Uh, there's a lot of manipulation and games played, and it's just I try to stay out of. Where do you think that comes from? Think the system may have treated them? I think it's a lot of the, them that way. a lot of it has to do with the uh, the fact that this is a very different situation from what most people are used to. Being locked in a cell for 23 hours a day, they lose something up here, and it makes them. Kind of yeah, but the, the very operation is bound to have leave mental effects and scars. Right. Uh, but a lot of it also, they, they're they like that on the streets, and they come here. And you grew them. up here, 21 to now? This is, yeah. I, boy, you grew I, up here. Boy, did I grow up. When I first got here, I was one of those knuckleheads who was always running off at the mouth of the guards, getting sprayed with gas and running on. And, oh, yeah. and I'm sure you saw plenty of those. <laughs> You finally gave up on that. Oh, yeah. Once you run your head into the wall enough times, it kind of sinks in, look, this is probably the wrong thing to be doing. And but that was really kid stuff. Yeah, that was kid stuff. That was a lot of anger of being locked up, being locked in the situation. What do you do with the anger? Right now? Yeah, what do you do with that? It's got to be there. I write. Yeah, got to be. I'm a, I'm a writer. Uh, that's why uh, writing is the best therapy I've ever come across. What do you do with your writing? I either give it to people, throw it away. Mostly it's for myself, so I throw a lot of it I know that stuff's valuable. I mean, I mean, this tape is valuable. Yeah. Because cause, cause you're, 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 you're sitting over there. You may as well be naked. Mm -hmm. You're exposing yourself to a guy you met, what, 20 minutes ago. Right. But you've heard my voice, so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know been, who is I mean, you've been there for nine years, man. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've... I've heard more of you than I've heard from my family. But you've got friends. Yeah. Because they called me. Oh, yeah. yeah they yeah. called me and said, the hell out so Stephen wants to do this. And I said, <laughs> are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Said, well, tell him. <laughs> but uh, uh, Michelle and I get along reasonably well. She thought I retired too, but not from execution. <laughs> right. Since this is your first time up, I think it's very high likelihood you're going to get to stay this time. That's what I'm thinking, especially with my attorney. I mean, I'm and scared to death right now, <laughs> but <laughs> well, of course. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, you can you can hear the bell tolling. Oh yeah. And, and oh, yeah. for whom the bell tolls, that's a piece of classic literature. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But it's your option after the stay. Mm -hmm. What I do with this tape? This is your tape. And if you want me to come back at some future date or just throw the whole thing away, I'll just let you know. Uh, my mother. Okay. Where's your mom? She is in Livingston today. Is she had come up to see me previous to this. Uh, oh, okay. She has a special visit with her tomorrow. And I have all day visits with her on Monday. Where does she live? She lives in Michigan. Michigan. Hmm. A lot of politics going on in Michigan. Yes. You know, I sometimes wish I could pack up and go up to Wisconsin, Michigan, and oh, man. get my hands in. I come from like a bunch of labor goons. Yeah. My parents yeah. were labor organizers, both of them. Oh, that's nice. So I come by prison show stuff. You get the labor show, show from the labor goon background. Right. Yeah. 
So that's exciting. How often does your mother get to visit? Uh, she visits once a year for the last few years. Uh, I haven't had barely any contact, but there's also been here. This is really hard on her. Harder on of her course. is on me. Of course, of course yeah. it's harder on her. Yeah, I know, I know people. Uh, uh, I run around with um, uh, Hurricane Carter. Mm-hmm. Uh, after he got out and mm-hmm. went to Canada, he and I had a joint gig at uh, uh, Santa Barbara, California. Yeah. And he said he wouldn't let his family visit. Mm-hmm. He said he didn't want to see him that way. Yeah. The issue I have in the courts right now, if it gets me a stay, it'll give me a new trial. And if I get a new trial, I'm not. It's like a new star. Not coming back. Uh, it's like a new star. Yeah, because I, I, I know I can win. Well, I, I hope you can get something done about Denton County. Yes. Well. If you get a new trial, maybe you can get a change of venue because Denton County is not the most the, kind place. The to district, take issues. the district, the head district attorney uh, who presided over my case is now a defense attorney. And I was, ah. I was thinking. <laughs> I was thinking. Uh, if I go back, that's going to be my turning. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know how... You know, one of the great blessings of my life is that I'm not a lawyer. Right. Uh, uh, <laughs> and that's that's real. That's up, up front with me. Uh, that's next on my agenda. If I it's can hard to get a lawyer to expose his own dirty laundry. Right. I don't care what side they're on, where they are. Oh, yeah. I, I was fortunate in my case here because I'm filing an effective assistance of state habeas counsel. Uh, because of yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I read that. You read I, that? I read that, and, and it's on. I've got it. That's on my Facebook. Right. So I'm at my my uh, uh, not Facebook, but on my website. So you've read where executionwatch.org. My, you've read where my state habeas counsel. Yeah. Admitted he messed up. Yeah, yeah. You have an admission yes. uh, on on habeas appealed. And so that would give you another sequence, right? Uh, at a minimum. Right. And so, why do you think they set your date? I know why they set my date. Uh, prison politics. Prison there, politics. There, there's, or? There, there's, a, there's a gang here in this prison who yeah. have a hit on me because of some website stuff. So, the captain of that gang sent a letter to one of my friends saying that he's going to start having people call Denton County Courthouse and ask them why they don't have an execution date yet. And so he did that and two weeks after I got kicked out of court I had an execution date. Have you had any dealings with the guy? Oh, when I first got here they tried to pick me up and I talked to him for a little while and it's a white supremacist gang. I'm not white. I'm, Ar- I'm Armenian. So, <laughs> yeah, Jewish boys don't do well. Right. <laughs> or Armenian boys, yeah. <laughs> or so, Turkish boys. So when I, when I, when they, when they found out they messed up, they, uh, you know, what happens with that? Um, so he getting a hold on the case. I want you to look into this camera for about three or four sentences. And I want you to talk to those people. Now, let me tell you who those people are. They're all over the world. Some of them are in Armenia. Mm -hmm. Some of them are in Saudi Arabia. Some of them are in Australia. And a good many of them are in England and Germany and Western Europe. You're sitting on death row in Texas. Yes. What do you want to say to them? I have no idea how I got here. I don't belong on death row. I've never killed anybody. Um, I've been involved in some pretty heavy in my life. But I, I don't belong here. Could this happen to anybody? Well, almost. Anybody. Yeah, almost anybody. Um, if you don't have money, if you're a minority, uh, you're on the wrong side of somebody's door. I mean, this, this can pretty much happen to anybody. Or at 21, if you're still a naive kid. Yeah, yeah definitely that too. And chemicals Man. don't help. Drugs put me here. Um, what are you going to do about that? That addiction's not going to go away when you get out of prison. I've been clean for. Sure. 
a long time. It's not hard to do here. It's yeah. harder to do out there. Yes, yes. I. But you, you don't have any running buddies to go home to. Exactly. I got a whole new line. You got a whole new line. And who have you met while you were here? I met Tolly, who has been a godsend. Uh, she's the lady I talked to. She's the lady I talked to, and uh, I'm going to marry The her. lady with all the enthusiasm oh, about yeah. my coming and interviewing. The one that's running around like a chicken with her head cut off. Yes, and she's going to be at the prison show on Friday. Um, yeah, I was blessed to have her in my life. She's around Houston giving talks to groups all week. <laughs> She'll be here to see me with my mother tomorrow, and that is going to be an adventure. Yeah, it is. It's the first time they've been together? It's the first time they've met, yes. Okay, okay. And you're excited about that? Oh, yeah. See, you actually do have a life. It's like pitting the Christians against the lions. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that may be an overstatement. Don't show that to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, are you all right? Yeah. You going to be all right? Okay. Even if the worst happens, I'm going to be all right. Even if the worst happens, I'm going to be all right. That's difficult for me to listen to. It's difficult for me to remember. It will remain on Execution Watch, the website, for as long as any of us are in any condition to maintain it. You have any comments? You know, this show tonight represents one reason why I hate the death penalty and also represents my frustration in talking about it. Because, number one, when we get prepared for these shows, all three of us, Larry, Susan, and I both, read all the opinions. We know what were said in the opinions. And then we hear a lot of accusations that have no basis in fact. And when you try to correct them, they accuse you of being a prosecutor. Sure. Uh, and, and it's real frustrating because as somebody once said, a zealot who believes in his cause has no end of lies he will tell to support his cause. And I don't think that does a death, both <coughs> of us opposed to the death penalty, it doesn't do us any good to have people exaggerating facts. No, Jim, I want us to stick and, to our principles. Uh, we're, we're crossing the line, your attorneys, but in this case, you read what's there and you exactly. report what you find. Exactly. And I will defend that as I have on this show. Right. Because you did <laughs> earlier with the lady. He, I thought, my God, all of a sudden, race become the prosecutor and you're talking to the aunt. Because no, no, no. I, have, I, I, I defend what we do in the show because I think we put enough kind of thought into it. Uh, S Susan, were you treated or mistreated in the show? Ray, you know better than to mistreat me, Ray. No, I've been treated wonderfully. Uh, and, and I try to report the facts. I, I, I mean, part of what, uh, what I talk about when I start is I go over the facts of the case. Now, the, those are the facts that are coming in the record. And we don't have the full trial transcript. We're working off the appellate You're record. You're working on the That's appellate right. record is all you had in this That's case. That's right. Uh, there are cases where we have more records. Yes. It's just the that... Problem, the problem, right, with the, with the death penalty case, usually the records are so voluminous at the trial level, and that's with the district clerk's office, and we can't get that. And all we know is exactly what was reported at the appellate level, and that doesn't necessarily... So they cherry-picked the issues. Well, it depends on how well the defense lawyer does the brief. That's all we able to read is what were the controversies. Because in a death penalty case, the record will fill up two or three boxes, and it would be impossible mm -hmm. for us to go through everything in the trial record. Number one, it's in the district clerk's office in whatever county the death penalty case occurred, and we'd have to check it out. It would take us uh, two weeks to go through the whole record, the trial record. So all we get is kind of a a bird's eye view of what they seem the issues were at trial. This doesn't necessarily mean that's all the evidence introduced at trial. And what we do is read what goes on at trial. I went before and get ready for these shows. I look at every record that we get. I look at the direct appeal, the court of criminal appeals, I look at the writs in state courts, I look at the writs in federal court, I look at the writs in the Supreme Court if there's any mm -hmm. published opinions. I'll read all of those and I summarize them. So I get a bird's eye view of what the issues were at trial that the lawyers wrote about. But that doesn't necessarily mean, mean you got a whole picture. whole whole picture. But what I get frustrated with is what I said earlier is when someone says something that's not Based upon the record, and you try to correct them, they start fussing at you that you're believing. Yeah, yeah, but I, 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 Jim, we don't have any choice. I understand. But to stick to the procedure that we've got, and the procedure that we got, Larry, I think is a sound one. 
And I didn't fuss at Larry about stuff. A- 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 absolutely. Oh, yeah, well, they absolutely. argue when they get out of here. and We argue uh, They argue here. <laughs> right. I mean, we, we, we've done that. Uh, 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 I, I, I want you to know that, that it's very difficult for me to listen to the interview I did with Stephen because when I did that interview, I was thinking this is your first mm. set date and statistically it's a higher likelihood that you're going to get a stay. And he was beginning to indicate, uh, uh, with his, uh, uh, tally, his friend and his mother that there was an emerging life Probably for the first time since he has been alive. He had no life as a punk druggie on the streets. And now at the end of this saga, he was developing one. Larry, does any of that impress you? Well, well, circumstances really have a profound impact on people. And a 31-year-old Stephen Michael Woods is probably a whole, after being on death row for nine and a half years, is likely a much different person than the defense lawyers saw when he was trying to prepare this case for trial. Uh, if, if he had the same attitude at the very beginning, I think he would have done himself a whole, but, but he was a different person back then. Uh, so the, the person who was executed, in all likelihood, is simply not the same person who uh, the, 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 the holding shows was, was involved in the crime. He's a, he's a different person. Well, one of the, we didn't get to discuss, uh, we haven't discussed yet the punishment phase of the trial, of what came out in the punis- punishment phase. And apparently what came out in the punishment phase is that when... Woods was arrested, picked up in California. He gave a interview with the police detective in California. And in that interview, he admitted that he was involved in another murder. And that probably, that, that might have had an impact. My on, my that bad. might have had an impact <laughs> on, I mean, that, that was presented. The also jury might have made a mistake. I mean, come on, of course well, it had an impact. I, and, Jurors and, and, heard that, they heard that, and um, that would be something they would consider in their deliberation. You know, I, I don't know uh, a 21-year-old fellow, a copy of the 31-year-old guy I talked to. I don't know how much of assistance he could have been to his counsel at 21. One of the problems, Ray, when you read the red opinion, is that he wouldn't cooperate in presenting mitigating evidence. He wouldn't cooperate with the lawyers. And that's one of the problems they had. In fact, as a matter of fact, there were three mitigating specialists that talked to him. The second one spent a lot of time with him alone in the room. And she said, there's no way in the world I could ever testify he wouldn't be a future danger. Get somebody else, but do not let them meet him face to face. Do nothing but look at the record. So obviously, he made a terrible impression on yeah, the mitigating that's, that's expert. That's exactly my point. Yeah. At 21 years old, I do not know that uh, he uh, could have been my chap. I've just received, it wasn't any help. It's horrible. Yeah, apparently. I just received a kite from the uh, executive producer that I've got to yield to. Elizabeth Stein is the executive producer. We couldn't do this show without the uh, wonderful direction of Otis McClay and uh, technically assisting us not only uh, in getting that interview but also in preserving this record uh, is Mark Pirtle. Uh, the videotape of today's show will be attached to our website. I want to thank, uh, of course, Jim Skelton, Susan Ashley, Larry Douglas. I want to thank uh, our uh, board op this evening. Doyle has done a wonderful job of balancing with all the technical difficulties we began with. The theme music is by Victoria Panetti. And unfortunately, we will back, be back this coming Thursday uh, uh, as Texas plans to execute Dwayne Buck. Uh, uh, despite uh, some racist testimony in his expert witnesses. My name is Ray Hill, and I do this not because I want to do this or like to do this. I do this because I believe this needs to be done.